Okay, then I would say we can get started. Um, again, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this ASWAD webinar. Um, my name is Maisha Auma. I am uh, the ASWAD Executive Secretary, and I'm going to start by introducing our president, Professor Kia Lily Caldwell, um, and uh, actually not introducing you, but, but handing over to you to um, start us off in this evening with a couple of remarks. Kia, the floor is yes. yours. Thank you so much, Maisha. Um, so hello, Aswad family and friends, and thank you for attending today's uh, tribute honoring Professor Machete Mugo. My name is Kia Caldwell, and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. Aswad was founded in 2000, and it is a not-for-profit organization of international scholars seeking to further their and our understanding of Africa and the African diaspora. We, we do this through conferences, which are held every other year, as well as symposia. I invite you to learn more about Aswad by going to our website, aswaddiaspora.org, as well as by visiting our social, social media channels. You can follow us on Instagram, X, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Our next conference will take place in October, 2025 in St. Louis, Missouri, where I am, and the conference theme and proposal details will be announced in the coming weeks. Today's webinar is truly transnational, so we have participants from all over the globe, and I want to thank them for taking time out of their schedules in various time zones to share reflections and memories and this tribute uh, to Professor Mugo. Our conversation offers an important opportunity to pay tribute to the life, contributions, and legacy of Professor Machere Githai Mugo, who was an Oswald co-founder and also a founding board member, serving on the Oswald Executive Board from 2000 to 2007. While Professor Mugo was born in Kenya, she lived in and contributed to multiple local, national, and transnational communities and struggles. Her intellectual prowess and commitment to anti-colonial struggles and a more just world deeply shaped Oswad and have left an indelible mark on our identity as an organization. Professor Mugo was instrumental in decolonizing the Kenyan educational system and in advancing the field of Africana studies as a faculty member and department chair at Syracuse University for 22 years, receiving numerous university and community awards during this time. The current leaders and members of Oswad stand on the shoulders of Professor Mugo. We are also blessed to benefit from Professor Mugo infusing the onion structure theory, which she proposed and developed in her highly acclaimed book, African Orature and Human Rights. And this has been infused into the Oswad community and family. Unlike many other scholarly organizations, within Oswad, there is an ethos of interconnectivity and communalism that shapes how we as members interact with one another and support the growth and intellectual development of fellow members of the Oswald family. We owe this in large part to the contributions that Professor Mugo made as an Oswald co-founder, as well as her nurturing spirit. I am looking forward to hearing all of the presenters' reflections today. and want to give special thanks to the presenters, as well as to Rochelle Roberts and Brian Matthews, who have provided logistical and technical support for today's event. My deepest appreciation goes to Professor Maisha Alma for organizing this event and moderating the discussion. So without further ado, I will pass everything back over to Professor Alma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President, uh, dear Kia. So um, I'm going to start us off by um, teasing out the structure of our webinar today. Uh, we are flexible time-wise, uh, but we do want to um, cap the event at around two hours. So um, what we want to do is look at different dimensions of Professor Michele Gidai Mugo's influence, transnational influence. We want to look at her scholarship. We want to look at her networks. We have heard from Pro Professor Caldwell, from President Kia, uh, Lily Caldwell, that um, Walimu... Um, Michele Gidai Mugo was involved in a lot of different struggles, uh, a true icon of, of uh, intersectional solidarity. 
So we're going to start off with Professor Wangoi Wagolo, who's in London. Uh, Wangoi, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Wangoi is the other networker uh, in our um, um, collectives here in Black Europe. So it's through Wangoi that I am able to uh, keep in touch with the different generations of um, freedom fighters of mostly of Kenyan diaspora and scholars. So I I, am, I owe you a lot, uh, Professor Wangoi Waguru. Um, you're a comrade and a friend. And uh, then we're going to go on to Professor Michael Gomez, um, who is a, um, a pillar of, of ASWAD uh, scholarship, but also networks. And um, my my very uh, uh, day one people in Aswad when I came to Aswad in 2017 in Sevilla, I have no idea if you still remember that, Mike. So um, um, you you were like at the beginning of my Aswad uh, uh, adventure, and and in that sense, you're a pillar of Aswad, but also a pillar of of my um, um, transnational scholarship. And uh, you are going to go second, and you're going to contextualize for us. Uh, what it was like starting out on the Agua journey because your 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 co-founders, your co-scholars um, uh, and comrades who began uh, this uh, amazing association, uh, the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. Then we are going to move on to the younger generation, and uh, we are going to speak to Dr. Rahab Jerry. Uh, Dr. Rahab Jerry is uh, in Cologne, in Germany. Uh, I am in Berlin, in Germany. So. Um, Jerry and I are colleagues in uh, navigating Black Germany, the, the two Germanys, uh, East German Blackness, uh, West German Blackness. And uh, I am extremely grateful to you uh, that you at short notice uh, took time out of your schedule to come here and uh, contribute to this tribute and talk a little bit about Mualimu, we share the Mugo's uh, influence on um, uh, multi-generational influence. You are also uh, not so long ago, I think it was last year with Mualimu in uh, Bayreuth at the University of Bayreuth, if I'm not mistaken with Bangui as well. So um, you, uh, it's, it's not so long ago that you were actually able to interact with um, Mualimu Mugo's thought and, and with her um, um, intersectional solidarity. And then we have a great, great honor to be able to welcome Mumbi Wamugo. And um, we, uh, we, we weren't sure if you're, able, you're going to be able to make it today. So we really want to thank you. It's with deep appreciation that uh, I want to say hello to Mumbi. Um, you're somewhere in, in, in the larger area of New York. Uh, yes. So um, um, you're going to, you're, you're welcome anytime Mumbi uh, within, uh, we can even hand off to you right now if 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 that's fine with you. We would love for you to say a few words on the life of Mualimu, uh, uh, Michelle Gidai Mugo, um, and what what is important to you also as her um, descendant, as her daughter. Obviously, in 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 your many roles, uh, being your own woman, but also being connected to an amazing comrade and freedom fighter and scholar. Uh, we would love to hear uh, definitely hear from you. And um, Wangwe Waguru sent me a, a, a note to say that you serve as a visiting academic as part of the practice of leadership program with the African Leadership Center in King's College, London. She wanted me to, to um, uh, take out that one part of your activities along uh, among a, a huge uh, um, uh, array of activities. So um, before we move to Wangoi, should, we, should I give the floor to you before I introduce Wangoi Mumbi? Would that be okay? I still I can't hear you right now. Um, for some reason, you're still muted. I can ask our technical support. I can chat with her and see if we can we can get that sorted out. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. So. Okay, you can sort that out in the background. Yeah. And while you're doing that, ah, you, you, uh, you're writing, speak at the end. That's fine, Mumbi, thank you so much. Perfect, thank you, Asante Sana. Okay, so I'm going to go over to Professor Wangoi Waguru. Wangoi Waguru is a professor of translation practice at SOAS in London. Uh, Wangoi serves as a visiting academic as part of the practice leadership program with the African Leadership Center. Um, Wangoi, you are widely acclaimed translate, translator. Before we started um, our panel, I was just uh, um, talking about 
how uh, you've translated Ngugi Wadiongo's work, Matigari is one of the, the works you've translated. And um, also you, you have uh, very many different translation projects also in Berlin uh, where Dr. Raham Jerry and myself were here at the Translationale uh, last year in November, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Wangwe Waguru um, has also initiated the translation of uh, Mwalimu Michele Givai Mugo's uh, poetry. Uh, which I was not familiar with yet, um, into many different languages, including German. So I, I had the great honor of translating one poem uh, through Wangori, and this poem is um, uh, Being a Feminist Is, uh, which I translated last November. So Wangori, you are an acclaimed translator, you are a writer, you are a poet, academic, cultural curator, and you're an editor with a great passion for languages, literature, and intersectional freedom. You have served as an academic and you support academic work through service areas of your academic interests, such as Women's Studies in the UK, African Studies Association, African Literature Association, and International Association of Translation Studies. You work as a reviewer and an editor, among many other things, and you have worked in international organization for the last 15 years. So I'm going, without further ado, I am going to hand over to you to, um, give us a perspective on Mwalimu Michele Gidhaya Mugo's transnational influence. And I know you have your own title, so tell us again what your title is. First of all, um, let me acknowledge this honor. Oh, this is my first as word. I've been eyeing it with envy, but my schedule and budgets have not allowed. And this year there was a double take. I did participate in the US but I was hoping very much to be in, uh, in Africa and was very proud that there was a joint initiative with ASAA, which um, I attended the first meeting of ASAA. So I'm very humbled to be here. And I'd first like to acknowledge um, uh, Aswad and all of the organizers, the chair, the president, yourself, Maisha, my long standing friend here in Europe with my wider German feminist family and uh, Rahab also, and, and Mike. Thank you for being a panelist with me. I'm very honored to speak in the presence of Mumbi, who I consider to be my niece and who I love dearly. And also to speak in the presence of our ancestor mother, Mishere Hidai Moko, and Mumbi's sister, and Mish Mishere's daughter, who always accompanies us in this journey, um, that is Jerry Wangui. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to do a very panoramic um, uh, talk, which will be addressing Michelle Morgo specifically as a waymaker, intellectual giant and activist, among so many other things, because we couldn't cover all the things that Michelle is, was and will be in this short time. But to, to say that we were deeply saddened by her departure and we also continue to share our condolences with Mumbi. And also we must remember Ama Ata Aidu, who was her friend, who died um, at about the same time. And they were very good friends and it would be difficult for us to speak about this loss without honoring I'm uh, at Aidu and also remembering her daughter and the wider families that they belong to in Syracuse, in Kenya, in Ghana. And as Michelle said in her wonderful de definitions of herself, Michelle was a transnational global citizen. So her family was very large. And as I told, I actually told my students yesterday because I've been, uh, I, as many of you know, I speak in many parts of the world, but I've decided to dedicate this year until Michelle Mogo's uh, one year anniversary to pay tribute or honor her. Even if I'm speaking about other things, I do preface my talk that it's, I am remembering her and being paying tribute to her. So yesterday I had a class with some students and we watched the video of Michelle describing who is Michelle Mogo. And I would urge, and it's produced by Washanga Dirango, and it, I would urge anyone who would like a, a, a summary of Michelle herself telling us who she is, lest we start putting her in boxes. And she, one of the very um, exciting lines in the, in the, in the self-definition is that she was beyond containment. 
And this idea for me is very appealing that we can be transnational, we can advocate for for from any location for and be in solidarity with with everyone or anyone who needs that solidarity. So in my own personal experience, I encountered Michelle Mogo when I was 10 years old through the Kenyan curriculum that was mentioned. So we were the first beneficiaries of that change curriculum in Kenya. And I studied an African oriented education, although my first four years I'd encountered the British colonial education remnants of. So it was so excited to cross over into decolonial education and to read poems by African writers and books by African writers. So at school we had to do elocution and we had to read her poem, I Took My Son by the Hand. And that changed my life in so many ways. And at the time when you're a young person, you don't realize the impact of literature and of these voices. But that's where my Pan-African literary journey actually began. And then, of course, as we continued, and I hope the story of the Kenyan curriculum will be written properly one day, then I encountered all the other great African and global writers they didn't just focus on African writers, they focused on, we, we encountered Lame, we encountered Francophone writers, we encountered Camus, we encountered Rabindranath Tagore, we encountered um, Kamau Breathwaite. So it was truly a global literary experience, which we're still, um, it's hard to imagine that we are beneficiaries of such when you go to other places and they're yet to begin to decolonize their curriculum. So we are avant-garde kids and we have a duty to hold the torch to those who opened the door for us and to thank them because it wasn't easy as Michelle Mogo's biography tells us. She went to school at Lemuru at a time where it was a racist. She was one of the first black children to go to high school in an all-white school. So again, when I say everything, so many things Michelle did she was a path breaker, first black person and second in high school, first person, first woman to go to Macquarie, first woman to go to, to, to be the dean of the faculty of the University of, of Nairobi and opening these doors, not just for the people in the university, but for the country. And then the wider Pan-African community as, as, you, as you, you have heard. So we cannot, it would be difficult to summarize her and she, and she's been fettered by giants like Beardon, JFO, amongst very many other people. And there's so many tributes all over the world um, that we have heard about her contribution to, to, to the world. But I wanted to focus on, on um, as well as talking about waymaking, I also wanted to talk about Michelle Everybody knows that she received this award for excellence for teaching at Syracuse University and she had very many students. And when she was retiring, many people came to the conference to say farewell to her. And it was the most resplendent occasion I have ever experienced in my entire life. And, um, and people paid tributes uh, about just how she had touched their lives. And I believe that a book by uh, Raffin um, had, has been published from some of the papers from that event. And you will see in the media that there was a very huge covering of Professor Michelle Mogo and more publications will be forthcoming because Michelle touched millions and millions of people as we were to learn from the experiences of her funerals, which became state affairs, as well as Ama Ata Aidu which also became global affairs because they were put out in, in the media and people were following from all over the world. And as I observed at the um, African Studies Association, where I paid the tribute on behalf of the Women's Caucus, that it is quite an extraordinary moment when two feminist icons are honored globally and in the case of Ama at Aidu, she was awarded a state funeral. So for intersectional scholars who were bold and brave and said many things which most of our governments find controversial, this is a great moment for those struggles for which 
they stood. And I was again telling my students yesterday, because we read the wonderful poem that we all love, we all love all of them, but the one that you decided to be a feminist is, this poem was actually published in 1974. And it continues to speak to the present reality, whether it's in Palestine, in Africa, whether it's around homophobia, and she uses these terms, Zionism, in 1974. And I, I was explaining to them just to look at the context of history and how ahead of time she was in just her intellectual thinking about freedom and freedoming humanity. But as many people know, Michelle was exiled from Kenya because of her quest for democracy and social transformation. Michelle Mogo was a socialist and feminist and an, an intersectional uh, person in her in her acts, she was involved in solidarity struggles with the liberation movements in Southern Africa and in Zimbabwe at the time, which was Rhodesia at the time in the 80s before their independence and, and felt that Pan-African spirit, um, which she carried with her all the time, including to um, New York, where she set up the wonderful Pakni organization. So wherever she, Michelle went, she was transnational, she was contextual in her location, but also globally, she continued to engage with as many, and she turned up physically, Michelle did. If you called her like we had her in Bayreuth, she was very ill, but she showed up for Washanga Dirango's screening on, of the film that he made about her, and at the ALA and in the academic circles where we encountered her, Michelle was down to earth. We knew she was a giant, not very tall, but you could feel her presence when she came, but she herself carried herself humbly and availed herself to us as young scholars, although part of us was trembling, were trembling in our bodies, but we enjoyed that she was collegiate and very supportive and encouraged us. If we didn't sit with our back straight, she kindly corrected us and encouraged us to be professional in those spaces and to seek truth and to seek knowledge, all kinds of knowledge and not to flinch from truth telling, which is what she did most of her life. And then of course she was, um, the struggle against uh, the dictatorship in Kenya cost her heavily and her young children, she had to escape. And it wasn't easy and I, uh, I'm writing as part of my own reflections, uh, what does a woman's exile actually mean? Because, you know, the, the, the expectations for a woman, a mother, a scholar to survive and to make it, it wasn't easy. And I did encounter Michelle when she was in that limbo space, trying to figure out what she was going to do with the two young children, Mombi and Jerry. I encountered her here in London 40 years ago, and that's not to uh, declare any young person's age, but I think Mombi was about eight at the time. And I like to tell that story uh, just um, as a reflection of just how far and how many years has have gone. And uh, I encountered Jerry and Mumbi and their mom, and then they ended up going to the States. And then they and they went back to Africa, to Zimbabwe, where Michelle was in exile, and then they returned to the United States and continued uh, their, academic, their academic life and the life that Michelle has lived. Um, I think she went to St. Lawrence. But I think, and then after that, she went to, to Syracuse, which has been her base for, for the years. But on this point, I, we sometimes overlook the role of children in these struggles. And Michelle did recognize the children as her comrades and friends. So I'd like to acknowledge Mombi for just being a very valiant comrade to her mother. It's who's a public figure as well, and what that means to be the person who's caring for her mom till the last days of her life. Uh, it cannot be easy. Uh, and just watching her struggle with the illness, which lasted a very long time, but still soldiering on and being able to accompany her, encourage her as a daughter, as a comrade, as a friend. So I'd like to acknowledge Mombi for that role, which allowed us to access um, Michelle because she had good support at home. And I know in my heart that it wasn't easy.
And I'd like to thank the community at Syracuse and the family around Mombi who are also propping and supporting her and the community in Pakni, which plays a very important role. And particularly the university gave Michelle a most resplendent farewell and gave her a day of her own. There is a Mishere Mogo Day, a civic day in Syracuse, where the, the whole state will be celebrating Mishere Mogo. That is the kind of person that Mishere was. So I don't think um, I would really like to enumerate her works, but in the interest of time, uh, there is the website that uh, the the, the Memorial Foundation, which um, Mombi has created, and Michere's work is also available. It's easy to find, but she wrote a lot of plays. She wrote poetry, as we have heard. She wrote critical works, uh, such as those that we've um, heard. Uh, and she uh, expounded not just the theories of things, but how things should be done. And I'm not reading my notes because I um, but I, I, I did want to say that um, she, a lot of people theorize in non-practical ways about how liberation can come. But Michelle was in the struggle itself. And she's, why I use this word path maker, because in the last years with my a colleagues of mine, um, Bessie, Mohanja, Mshai, Mongola, Betty, Wamboy, we've been undertaking the research uh, on Michelle's work quite deliberately, just to tell her that she will not be forgotten. And we did that work in her lifetime and in invited her to come and participate and be present. Well, very, very daunting to, to be talking about such a Supreme Scholar's work in their presence, but just as part of the, of the journey. And rather than talking posthumously, we talked about her work as Jerry, was present on this meeting uh, and Washanga and many other witnesses bore witness in her lifetime and in her presence. So um, uh, we, we, we became aware of this path making and I just want to talk about two ideas and hope that other people can come in and mention other ideas but the two things that have struck me was the that she began to talk about Utu and Utu centrism which is the African way of Ubuntu as a, as a method to place the human at the center of all human activities, which people mention because it sounds cool. And I know President Obama mentioned it, but people don't actually look into the practice of Utu and Ubuntu. And Michelle embodied these things. Her presence amidst people was a practice of Utu and Ubuntu. She was a kind person and always looked out for other people. And even her students, she would go the extra mile in her teaching. So she produced an ethic of freedom in, in, and she, you could see physically, even when the challenges and the conversations were difficult, she always found a way, a kind way of coming back to resolve issues. And I speak partly because I had opportunity to observe her myself, very privileged because um, I, I travel in the same circles that she does as a literary scholar, an African literary scholarship. So I, I was very privileged over this period of 40 years to see that kindness. And I had get, given the example before that when when Wangui passed away, Michelle did come to African Literature Association and she was asking us as we little group of Kenyans gathered around and she wanted to hear about each one of us, although she had lost a child, you know. It's afterwards that when she had a headache and was a bit distressed, the person I was sharing a room with, she asked her for some medication. Then we, we were struck by she, at no point did she complain or moan and say, oh my God, I'm very sad, I've lost. She was there present worrying about us, the youngest scholars. So this baton passing is really important, especially for, for scholars, young scholars, scholars who have to now carry this baton forward um, and to uh, to carry her work forward as well uh, and to find that Michelle spirit that is generous. But she was a very rigorous scholar and highly critical 
and nothing escaped her eye. So you couldn't fluff your way through anything with Nishera. She would call you out, but she would call you out kindly and you would have to learn to present yourself um, in the proper way. Um, and, and she didn't do it out of unkindness because she wanted the best out of you, whether you were a friend or her family or you were her, her students, she would call you out in a, in a good way that made you go back and do your homework. And sadly to say, I've been a recipient of that calling out, but I took it with grace and feel very thankful that I had that privileged uh, position of, of even having that presence to um, chide me and also in the political sphere, because I have myself have been in exile, it was wonderful to have somebody to look up to. I saw how she carried herself with grace. I'm also a mother. And I saw that you could bear it. It's difficult, exile. It's very difficult. I think my camera is sliding. Um, but she carried it with grace and she carried on with the work as, as, as necessary. Um, I could come back to uh, many other issues, but the main thing that I wanted to say is that she, she has really been celebrated by so many people. Give me one second, please. Can you see, can you hear me? I can still hear you. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm just looking for a little document here if you can just give me one minute uh, yeah, that's fine while you're looking just tell me when you're ready to to pick up again uh, i'd like to acknowledge peggy pisha from adefra black women in germany katya kinder so we have the the black drum and feminist collective uh, joining us at, at this hour there was another event um, so I'm I'm happy that you're able to make it. When you're when you're when you're ready to to continue, just go ahead. But um, I'm going to share some thoughts on on the perspective you're opening to us while you're looking for your document. So thank you again for um, um, talking about uh, how Walimu um, Michelle Gidai Mugo touched the lives of millions. That sounds like it always sounds like a kind of. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, in German, we'd say Aspruch. It sounds like something you just would roll off your tongue very easily. But when you begin to go in, in depth into what her networks were, um, what exactly her, her contribution to the, to the anti-colonial struggle was uh, in, in the form of African literary uh, uh, scholarship, when you speak about her institutional reform and institutional transformation of the Kenya uh, higher education system, but also of the of the Kenyan curriculum, and then going on to Zimbabwe, then you you begin to flesh out more what it really means uh, to say that she touched the lives of millions, but also at the same time being uh, um, making herself available is is a super important part of being able to touch people's lives. So just briefly, uh, two more things. Uh, thank you so much again for saying that it's important to. Um, uh, hold her, her daughters in our thoughts, Son Jerry Wangari, Mumbi Wamugo, who's with us today, and that that they were uh, uh, comrades and a, an important part of the work that Mwalimo was doing, and uh, um, that they're able, obviously, uh, uh, to have a more uh, nuanced view of, of what it means to uh, bring so much um, energy into these struggles, obviously. Um, um, that being a part of their of their family texture and, and, and being a part of their growing up. So thank you again for pointing that out. Um, and also thank you for pointing out that it's important to commem comm commemorate also the loss of Ama Ata Aidu. Um, I remember, and Peggy Pisha is here now, uh, Peggy, you organized the, the last uh, African Literature Association conference. Uh, you were one of the co-conveners. Uh, uh, that that took place in Germany. I know the last one. I think uh, took place in in the U.S. But um, before the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, you had organized in Bayreuth, Bayreuth uh, the African Literature Association um, conference. And I remember Ama Ata Aidu sitting in the first row, <laughs> being very vocal uh, um, about uh, uh, the Afrofuturist framing of the conference uh, down to uh, uh, the, what the, the, the conference poster looked at with a, a deep sense of humor, but um, also with, with the richness of, of her feminist African scholarship. So uh, I'd like to, to actually reinforce what, what Wangoi has said, that uh, we lost two great feminist Africans uh, last year who were 
uh, key to the Pan-African struggle and were key to the anti-colonial struggle. And um, before I hand back over shortly to Wangoi to, to uh, wrap up her comments, I also want to point out um, the, um, the anti-colonial the anti work, the co collaborations. Uh, here, the collaboration with uh, Mwali Mungugi Wazyongo. Um, this was new to me. I was learning this through Wangoi that uh, um, um, Mungugi Wazyongo and, and uh, Mwali Mungugi Gizaya Mugo co-wrote the trial of Dead and Kimathi, which is like the one of the core anti-colonial struggles in the Kenyan context against uh, British imperialism, and uh, about how um, the freedom fighters were brutalized um, by the um, um, by extremely manipulative strategies of the colonial government, and uh, how it's actually an Afrofuturistic um, uh, take on 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 this uh, um, traumatic situation. Because Zedan Kimathi, uh, who was an iconic bill, uh, an iconic picture of 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 the um, uh, when he's imprisoned uh, with his dreadlocks, but um, these uh, this uh, piece was was a piece that was uh, reconstructing what it would have meant to actually listen to what the the anti-colonial philosophy of this movement and and of the actors in this movement would have been. So uh, this is all through uh, Wangoi Waguru's uh, scholarship that I am able to look more deeply into um, the collaborations that are the, the um, foundation of, of our anti-colonial struggle uh, in East Africa, um, in Kenya in particular, uh, but also that have transnational meaning for the Pan-African movement and for the movement for black liberation in general. And it's making me think, and I know also when we speak to, uh, we listen to the other speakers, that there's rich material to actually put together a transnational uh, Michel Givaye Mugo syllabus, so that um, we're able to, to teach a body of work for people who, who are trying to uh, gain access, um, like I am at this point. So Wangoi, uh, I, what is Wangoi writing? Did I write something? Um, it's 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 very it's it's very interesting because um, th there's there's a, a a club of Wangoi uh, fans, <laughs> super fans in Berlin, and for some reason the Adefra uh, crew is under your your Zoom, uh, so the, the Adefra crew is writing that they're in the House of Cultures of the World, the Hakavi House of Culture and the World. I think uh, just now Katya Kinder wrote through your your um, uh, Zoom account. So, yeah, I'm going to hand back over to you so you can wrap up your comments for the first round. We can definitely come back to you uh, again after the other speakers. Yeah, yes, and thank you for that wonderful summary and the conversation and joining the conversation. So the, I think I'll just make two more two more points if you can hear me. And I wanted to talk about Oricha, which I hope that um, uh, that that uh, Jerry will continue to expound upon, uh, which was the acknowledgement of knowledges which are not in the written form. And this idea was first um, uh, articulated by, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> it will come, uh, my God, Pio Zirimu. It was first articulated by Pio Zirimu, but Mijeri Mogo activated it and made it real and live. And if you see her work is performative, but she acknowledges that there's intellectual work outside the academy and outside the written form. So for example, they had started with other feminists in Kenya to collect the knowledges around the women who were involved in the liberation struggles of Kenya. Like I know she, uh, the, the late, and even it's a sad recognition that the uh, Wakirima, also one of our big freedom fighters, she also passed away during this period. Um, and one of her other comrades, Shadra Guto, who she was in the struggle with, also passed in this period with, after she had died. So these are big moments in the Pan-African and anti-colonial struggles that we're losing people. So I did want to mention this idea of, 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 of Oricha, which has been very foundational for me because it enabled me to do my translation work with an ear for the African languages and a pride because we're coming from cultures where our languages were denigrated. We are not taught our languages to this day in our African schools, but I started to feel pride and I didn't understand because it's this influence of, you know, the, the great uh, Gugi himself and Michele Mugo articulating and theorizing this idea of um, 
of, of, of origin. I think I'll pause there and I'll come back uh, in the in the conversation, but I think that Michelle Morgo's courage and selflessness and commitment to transformation cannot be questioned. And we have a very hard road to and footsteps to follow. And I thank all the colleagues and friends who are accompanying us today on this tribute. Thank you very much. Bangoi, deep appreciation to you for um, giving us this um, the depth of, of um, the influence of Mwalimu um, Misheva Givaya Mugo's work and also the, the last point you made on Orita, um, which I think is also an outstanding, um, um, an, an outstanding quality of uh, intersectional uh, um, uh, solidarity and in, in, within scholarship to conceptualize a, a, a form of scholarship that does not only function within the academy, but actually, um, um, at the beginning, in in Mwalimu Ngugi Wadhiongo's tribute to to uh, Professor Michelle Givaya Mugo, he also emphasizes that the first thing they did when beginning to write the trial of Dedan Kimathi was actually to visit the places that had had shaped uh, uh, his life as a freedom fighter and and as a person who was connected to his community, and to actually speak to the people and see how that that is relevant. To the community that 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 uh, uh, gave gave these freedom fighters life, and and therefore gave the struggle life. So the idea of a more um, transgressive or connected I I'm, I'm searching for a word here form of scholarship that acknowledges uh, knowledge that is not has not been put into writing could not be put into writing maybe because it was also dissident knowledge or a, a knowledge that was going to um, um, uh, get, be punished in in some forms as it was in the through the, the um, white imperialist colonial uh, uh, structure, um, that's a very important point to be making. I could go on going uh, engaging with your thoughts, um, but I want to come to our next uh, pillar in, in this uh, webinar. And uh, I want to uh, introduce Professor Michael Gomez. Um, so uh, I already did the more personal introduction uh, <laughs> from my subjective position from meeting you, from the pleasure of meeting you in Sevilla, that, that you're, you're one of my day one as what people, Peggy Pisha can attest to this, Peggy is also now uh, in the audience. So, so Michael Gomez is currently Silver Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University and the Director of NYU Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora. Uh, you have served as the founding director of uh, this association of Aswad from its inception in 2000, uh, 2000 uh, to 2007. So for those who have not been looking at their calendars, uh, Pro Professor uh, uh, Kia Caldwell, um, uh, Madam President, already said we are going to be celebrating 25 years of Aswad uh, next year in 2025. And Professor Michael Gomez has been there for this adventure from the beginning of uh, the birth of this institution, of this association. Uh, you're also the founding editor of the Cambridge series on the African diaspora, Cambridge University Press, and general editor of its Cambridge history on the African diaspora. And you have chaired the history departments at both NYU and Spelman College, and you were pres president of UNESCO's International Scientific Committee for the Slave Root Project from 2009 to 2011. Uh, you have published extensively and you, you sit on many uh, associations that are relevant to the Pan-African transnational Black liberation struggle. I'm going to uh, uh, shorten that bit and refer everyone to our website. Um, as what would, is unimaginable for me without uh, your contribution. And uh, I'm, I'm going to disclose this um, Coming from from the history, uh, as as scholars who are stepping into all of your foot, uh, giants' footsteps, sometimes uh, I'm not aware of what of the connections that are there, and and then I'm pleasantly surprised and mind blown to understand that you and Walim Michele Gidai Mugo were co-founders of the Association of the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. So we would like to request you to give us an idea of what it was like. Um, what kind of situation was that where you um, founded this organization and what else would you like to share with us about um, the the time that you were able to spend with Molimu Mishela Gibaya Mugo? The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for that um, 
gracious introduction, Dr. Alma. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is, is that, okay, fantastic. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for uh, of this session for uh, your invitation, uh, Dr. Caldwell, Dr. Alma. Thank you so much uh, for your service and for putting uh, this panel together. And uh, I'm delighted to be uh, with you um, in the presence uh, of uh, a dynamic, brilliant uh, African women. And uh, so it's my honor to be uh, among you. Uh, it, uh, it, is, it, it was obviously a mistake uh, to allow Professor Wangui Wagoro to go first because she has taken, she said just about everything that I would like to say in terms of theme, but uh, I will uh, do my best. Uh, I want to make a few comments and, uh, at two different registers, one at the personal and then one at the more structural uh, with respect to uh, Dr. Uh, Michere Mugo. Um, didn't know her obviously as well as a number of you uh, but I was uh, blessed and fortunate enough to to know her uh, to some extent. And uh, what I would say uh, with respect to the at the at the register of the personal is that um, uh, there was never a moment, there was never a second in which I did not understand that I was in the presence of some sort of royalty, some sort of uh, she had a regalness about her. Uh, she had, there was an air about her that was exceptional. And, uh, you know, she, she, uh, she moved and spoke and engaged with such grace. Uh, it was, it was phenomenal. And so, uh, uh, it was, I always felt so, uh, fortunate to have, to have worked with her as a colleague. And there, there's another thing I want to say about this, and then I want to move into a different uh, uh, discussion. And that is, um, you know, uh, as an African in exile, the dynamics between myself and uh, comrades, brothers and sisters from the continent, those dynamics can be, they can differ. And they, you know, you know, it depends upon the circumstances and with whom you're engaged. My sense with Professor Mugo was that she was one of she was one of those who, uh, with whom I felt uh, a level of comfort and community and association in which I didn't experience. I did not experience uh, a degree of separation. And that kind of welcoming, that kind of acceptance was very, very important to me. Uh, Professor Alma, I haven't had an opp enough opportunity to, I, have, I don't know Professor Alma uh, that well, but I have that same sense with her. My, uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Bubakar Bari, who is currently in Senegal, was one of those as well uh, with whom um, I, uh, you know, experienced that that level of acceptance, and so, you know, for someone in exile, that's very, very important. And and I will be, I will forever be grateful uh, to Michelle for that. So, with that said, I want to take you on a bit of a journey. I want to go back to, um, I want to go back to 1995 because that's when I first actually saw Professor Mugo. And I don't think that I met her even at that point. But 1995 was really a critical moment, I think, uh, in, the, uh, in the history of, of scholarship on both Africa and the African diaspora. Because um, uh, in in the in the in the spring of 1995, um, Dr. Philip Curtin had uh, published 
an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it was entitled The Ghettoization of African Studies. Uh, some of you uh, may have may remember that. I think probably most of you are too young to, to remember that remember that. But it was uh it was quite divisive. It was quite divisive. And uh uh essentially he was uh he was uh making he was arguing uh that um uh hiring in African studies had taken on a quality of racialization and that it was favoring Africans, African descendant scholars, and, and it was uh, uh, lowering the standard of, of, of scholarship. And uh, in response, a number of scholars organized a panel at the African Studies Association uh, meeting uh, in Orlando. Not quite sure when that took place, uh, but I was there. And um, I was sitting next to my mentor, Buba Kobari, uh, right at the front. We had, there was a, a round table and the, this huge ballroom was filled. It must, there must've been hundreds of people in there. Upon the dais sat um, a rather uh, a cantankerous uh, uh, Philip Curtin uh, in response to a panel uh, I, I, I remember uh, Michael West was on that panel, but I remember uh, Dr. Richard Mugo was on that panel. And uh, it, uh, it, was quite the, it was quite the experience. Uh, Professor Mugo uh, delivered a scathing uh, response to Dr. Curtin, to which there was a visceral response uh, uh, in the in the audience uh, of of support, and uh, so it left quite an impression upon me. Now, what's an interesting about this is that the it was that the curtain debacle and uh, the politics of the African Studies Association are what led to the creation of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. That is to say, there were a number of that a number of us who left that meeting. Um, rather disoriented, but clearly of the we, we had concluded that uh, the ASA was not for us. It was not an organization that was truly interested in uh, Africans, African descended people. And so we set out upon a very different journey. Uh, and it took a couple of years to put it together. Uh, there was a crucial meeting. This is just the history of those of you who are interested in ASWAT. There were there were a couple of crucial meetings. One uh, at the Univer University of Georgia in Athens. Uh, at that point, I was uh, on the faculty there. And uh, Rosalind Torborg Penn, uh, who's no longer with us, was there. Colin Palmer, who's no longer with us, was there. Uh, Margaret Washington, uh, Sterling Stuckey, and so forth. And so we set about uh, to create this new organization and uh, Michele quickly joined us and was a founding board member of ASWAD. And uh, I would say that I believe she was on the board for between 2000 and 2007. And uh, even after she rotated off of the board. She continued to be uh, in contact with me and, and, and I presume other uh, uh, members, uh, uh, leaders of, of ASWAT. In 2011, she did give the keynote address at the ASWAT conference in Pittsburgh. And so um, Having been in leadership in ASWAT for some time, I was I really relied upon Michelle's leadership, her her wisdom, her advice. Uh, she was uh, someone who always uh, provided sage counsel, because this was a fledgling organization. We had no money. Uh, we were trying to find our way, and uh, we had to navigate through some fairly uh, uh, significant 
uh, challenges, controversies, uh, matters that could have easily uh, ended the organization. And uh, so, you know, we had to go through matters of, you know, creating a constitution, what, what would the membership be like and so forth, the structure of it. But more importantly, we had to negotiate what was ASWAT, what was our mission, what were we trying to accomplish. And uh, Michere was, 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 Professor Mugo was uh, an important voice in helping us to create an organization that was distinct from others and that saw its, its mission as one that, that, that would bring together scholars, activists, other stakeholders in the global African experience, bring us together, uh, provide a forum for cutting edge scholarship, uh, a, a, a space within which all would be welcome, all would be welcome and create uh, a circumstance in which, you know, difference and disagreement and debate could flow. Yes. And uh, uh, after which we could continue on uh, uh, as, as community. And so uh, Professor Mugo was in, uh, she was in, um, uh, rather elite company, if you look at some of the people who were involved in uh, in ASWAD from its founding, we had Professor Mugo, I've mentioned Margaret Washington and, and Rosalind Turborg Penn, uh, Professor Stuckey, uh, Ileze Sumoni was there, Vereen Shepard, um, uh, Colin Palmer, who's no longer with us, uh, James Millett, uh, Pat Manning, uh, Abiola Irele, uh, Jane Ife Kunigwe uh, was with us at one point, uh, Robert Hill, uh, Abanabusia, uh, David Barry Gaspar, it just goes on and on, uh, Carol Boyce Davies, uh, uh, Hillary Beckles. So the <laughs> We had quite the we had quite the constellation of scholars working in Africa, in North America, in Latin America, in the Caribbean. We did not have <clears throat> the kind of presence that we wanted from Europe, and uh, so I'm delighted that that uh, Peggy uh, and uh, Maisha and others have, have have come to to you know to fill that void. Yes. Uh, so I would say that uh, it was uh, through uh, Professor Michele Mugo's stellar leadership that navigated that we were allowed to we were able to navigate through some very difficult uh, turbulent waters. I mean, one of the main issues that we had to contend with very early on is what would be our relationship to how would we fund ourselves. What would be the source of the streams of our funding? And uh, she was one of those uh, who was of the opinion that ISWAT needed to be an independent organization so that we could always have an independent voice. And so uh, as we go forward, uh, I think that the more activist element that we've, we've always wanted uh, for the organization still needs to you know, still needs to come into full, uh, um, full uh, uh, efflorescence, if you will. We still need to um, uh, develop that aspect of the organization. Uh, it's not my responsibility to do that anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, that's another thing that we, you know, agreed upon is it was it was that you know when your day is over, it's over. So uh, I'm I, so once again, I thank you for allowing me to participate in this conversation. And uh, I look forward to to uh, to what follows for what remains of the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Almer. Thank you so much, Professor Gomez. Deep appreciation. Uh, you know we are going to keep bothering you uh, in in different capacities. So uh, while you're not on the board anymore, you are in committees, and uh, you know that we have no problem constantly <laughs> looping back in and getting some input. 
So just very quickly also in response to the um, to what you have teased out, thank you for giving us an idea of um, the, the um, again, of the struggle, the specific uh, uh, situation um, that you tried to find an answer with, with this uh, um, um, association, with this scholarly association for uh, young scholars, especially here in Black Europe, it's it's a, an important uh, um, um, it's an important organ, but also an important symbol to know that there's a, a scholarly um, a society that uh, um, is is uh, um, committed to creating bridges between the um, transnational Black Studies movement and African studies, because African studies in very different parts of the geopolitical constellation, especially here in Germany remains a very, very, uh, uh, through the coloniality of, of knowledge and power, um, um, occupied space, a space that is more, uh, has an, a more neo-colonial and, and then plus a neoliberal structure. So um, these set of concerns that were at the beginning of, of the foundation of ASWAD um, are with a certain lateness in Black Europe um, things that we are grappling with, only now we are grappling with them, but in, uh, involved in a network, and we are able to show a symbol, a, a scholarly organization that is now going to be 25 years old. So that's the difference. It's it's uh, joining the struggle on a on a different set of circumstances, and this is thank, uh, thank thanks to your work and thanks to the work of Malimu Michel Regidai Mugo. So I, I deeply appreciate that. That would be the 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 first response that, that I wanted to make. That um, definitely this this idea of of the um, what the connection and and the and the area of of working together between um, Black studies and and African studies. Uh, this is a model that's been really important to us and continues to be important uh, in our situation here in Black Europe and I'm sure in other parts of the world. I'm sure in Latin America as well. Then the second point, it's it's three short points. The second point I want to make is actually the point you entered with, which I cannot emphasize enough. Uh, it's important to have scholars who are willing to do the in-depth work of relinking. Um, this again is the idea of global Africanness and about how um, uh, the logics of, of coloniality, of power, and also of, of white, uh, white centric and West centric supremacism is to divide to further divide us and and to make us uh, uh, think that in the neoliberal economy it makes sense to to fight separate battles. So I am deeply committed, obviously, to this uh, idea of relinking um, um, the, uh, global Africanness, and uh, uh, we need partners for this work. So obviously, Peggy Pisha, who facilitated the connection to me, uh, to Aswad, and 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 to you, um, uh, was one of the people who were working towards bridging this this gap. This is also a question that's important to us in Black Europe, also to have contact um, with contemporary uh, um, um, philosophy, intersectional philosophy, and also uh, um, uh, power critical studies in the on the African continent. And Wangoi made the point of saying that the conference in Accra. Uh, this year was also one such uh, um, um, walking the talk uh, uh, to have the conference in Accra. And the last thing I would like to say is on the um, um, about the the perspective of the organization and uh, about the pragmatism that I am hearing behind uh, being an independent organization and funding ourselves. And uh, uh, it's important for us to hear that these were concerns that you also had, that you and Mali Michel Gidai uh, Mugo and Viren Shepard and Abina Busia and all the colleagues you men mentioned, Sterling Stuckley, who uh, um, had this at the beginning of the of, of the organization, that we still grapple with with um, the ethics and the philosophy behind that, behind saying we need to be financially independent. So um, we might not have arrived at the point at which we 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 hope uh, uh, we can arrive at, but we're in a good place. And so next year, the 25th um, anniversary, um, that might also be an, an idea to revisit um, what the, uh, the, the first group that initiated this adventure, uh, what kind of visions you all had for this organization and how we can revitalize those visions as well. I am looking forward to that. Um, you, as well as Professor Wangwe Wagoro, are going to be able, again, to uh, link in and, and discuss some more. Um, I'd like to um, 
um, introduce our uh, last speaker for today. So we do have a discuss discussant and commentary in Mumbi Wa Wamugo. Anytime you're ready, Mumbi, you said at the end. Uh, but for now, we're, we're going to have our last speaker in the uh, in our circle, and that is my esteemed colleague, uh, dear dear friend Rahab Njeri, who is at the University of Cologne and who, to my pleasure, constantly uh, makes her way over here to Berlin uh, to share some time. I also, once in a while, not as often, I'm able to make the trip to Cologne. Cologne is in West Germany, and Berlin is way in the east. For those who are trying to figure out what the logistics of that are. So Dr. Rahab Jerry is a historian, scholar, and community activist, a moderator as well as a curator. Um, Jerry is the diversity and racism critique officer in the gender studies department of the University of Cologne, which is a very important position as a diversity worker, but also a position with a lot of responsibility and um, I'm going to say institutional suffering as well. So this, this is also one area where, where we have met. And you're also active in the Black Studies Curriculum Working Group in the Intersectional, intersectional Black yeah. Europeans. And Jerry is a mother of two wonderful children. Uh, you are actively engaged in the restitution debate in your city. You serve as a board member of several organizations, including the Health Committee of the City of Cologne, uh, Postcolonial Legacy, Postcolonialist Erbe, Postcolonial Heritage uh, Köln, and also an international African school. You're the founder of Kemet Awards for Achievement in African Languages, whose patron is Professor Ngugi Wadhyongo, Mwali Ngugi Wadhyongo, and you currently work as a consultant for uh, developing anti-racist and anti-discrimination policies and strategies, as I said, at the University of Cologne as an di intersectional diversity worker. Jerry, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I don't even know where to start because it seems as if everything has already been said. Um, so... <laughs> Start with the with a photograph behind you where we see Mwalimu Michelle Gidaya Mugo. Yes, can you see her? Do you, yes, that was uh last year where she visited us in uh in Bayreuth. And you can see as I also speak about her today, I cannot I cannot stop smiling, as you also can see in the picture, because every time I mention her name and every time I see her picture, I'm filled with so much joy. And I am so glad that I was able to, to meet her in person and I was able to break bread with her. So um, that's why I put the picture there to also remember um, that beautiful moment um, that was captured through that picture, but that beautiful moment that we also had in, in Bayreuth. Um, so um, also for me, um, Good, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the organizers of the event and thank you so much, Professor Maisha, uh, for also inviting me. Uh, and I also want to say uh, a great thank you also to my sister, Mombi. She knows I call her my sister because I'm also called uh, like her sister, Jerry. Uh, and I always thank her because of not only going with our mother through this journey, but also accepting to go through this journey with our mother. Um, I want to um, also say thank you for inviting me and also for allowing me to share this space and also allowing me to say something today. So this is why I was saying I'm a mother, because now she wants something to drink. Just give me one minute and then I'll be there. <laughs> one yes. No problem. Uh, tend, tend, tend to the drinks. Uh, as soon as you're ready, just tell me you're ready to, to uh, resume. So again, uh, I'm going to contextualize the photograph you're seeing at the University of Bayreuth. This was actually in celebration of Mi Mi uh, Michelle Gidaya Mugo's 80th birthday. So I'm going to say if I look like that at 80, I'm all set. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <this one>. uh... <laughs> Yes, so thank you. Yeah, that was my daughter for one minute. And so as I said, I'm very honored to be here and also uh, allowed to share this space and also allowed to, uh, to celebrate Michelle Mugo. Um, so I wrote something so that I don't forget because I know I can say a lot, but I'm going to try uh, as much and keep the time. Um, so today, as we gather uh, to celebrate the remarkable legacy of Malimo Michelle, a distinguished scholar activist whose contribution have left an indelible mark on academia and social activism. Celebra celebrating the life of Malimu Mishere, a she rose, a daughter of the soil, daughter of the universe, Malimu Mishere Gidai, the titan of Utu, mother of many, the one who travels, the one who visits, and indeed she did visit us. A sister, a planter who has planted many seeds across across the globe, and I am one of them, 
one of the many daughters of Mwalimu Mishere Gedai Mugo. I also want to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulders of many Black women who have come before me, challenging the glass ceiling also here in Germany. And in a time where we are scared and overwhelmed, one of the reasons that I have hope for my generation and the next generation and a light at the end of the tunnel is because of African women scholars such as Mwalimu Mishere, Mwalimu Wagoro, Mwalimu Maisha, the Adifa women who I'm really happy that they are here for the work that they have done and continue to do for my generation. So this picture was taken when we were in Bayagoit where we also saw the documentary of Professor Washanga making life sing in pursuit of Utu, the Michelle Mudai, Michelle Gizai Mugo story. And in this uh, documentary, there's a part where she speaks about generations in Rhodesia. She engages in the revisioning of the dominant story, which is the story of a white man. But Malimu Mishere rewrites the story with the agenda of a dream for the present and future of Africa. I am, we are the present and the future of Africa. At the same time, while watching the documentary, I had so many emotions and so many questions. I was happy, grateful, proud, but angry at the same time. Angry that my generation had been denied the teachings of Mwalimu. Angry because when I had my literature classes in my university, she was invisible in my literature list, in my citations, and nobody ever mentioned her work. My generation was denied this knowledge that Mwalimu has archived in her writings and in her work. But we are reclaiming her back and proudly seeing her name. And I remain hopeful because there's a generation of young African black scholars in the diaspora on the move, picking up where Mwalimu Mishere Mugo and her generation left off. Mwalimu Mishere's literary contribution are pivotal in shaping African literature as we have heard. Works like The Trial of Dead and Kimadi together with Professor Ngugiwa Thiongo and Daughters of My Land remain timeless expressions of resistance. And of course, Mwalimu Mishere's feminist perspectives have been instrumental in changing patriarchal norms. Through her writings and activism, she advocated for the empowerment of women, emphasizing the importance of gender equality and women's rights in African societies. And in the realm of academia, where the pursuit of knowledge intersects with the ongoing struggle of equity and justice, the work of Mwalimu Mishere continues to play a vital role. Her contributions are not only intellectually enriching, but also in instrumental in addressing, for instance, the work that I am doing in terms of anti-discrimination or racism in institutions. Mwalimu Mishere's impact, as we have heard, and we can see for those who are also in this meeting, transcends geographical boundaries. She has been a vocal advocate of human rights, social justice, and pan-African solidarity. Her involvement in international organizations and conferences have amplified her influence, inspiring a global network of scholar activists. So when I look back, and I think those of us who, are, who uh, organized the meeting of Carl when she came, um, and also when she came to Bayreuth, I now think that it was one way of her passing of the baton to us, mentoring and guiding us on how to continue this race. When she came to Cal Conversations and elected in this story, we had over 400 participants, many of whom were really young African scholars located all over the world. And so it, she made a huge impact when she came because as I said, many of us did not even know that she existed. Many of us did not even know that she was still there. So you can imagine, and then someday I'll send a video where she's talking to us and nobody could, you could hear a, draw, a pin drop. That's how quiet it was on Zoom. And everybody was so happy and we even had participants who cried afterwards because they said that had been their dream um, to ever speak or even see Mwalimu Mishere. So, she imparted not only knowledge, but also a sense of social responsibility. Her dedication to developing the next generation of scholar activists was evidence in the many lives she touched and continues to touch. 
And after our conversation with Mwalimu, we felt that it was one way of her taking also it as her responsibility to transfer informational and knowledge wealth through generations. That wealth of wisdom has made me and maybe some of you who are here today invaluable to the new generation of scholar activists, organizers, social justice activists also within the academia. And despite her significant achievements, we must also not forget that Mwalimu, as uh, Mwalimu Goro has also mentioned, faced challenges and even persecutions for her outspoken activism. And I could remember where we took this picture, where she spoke a lot about her struggles together with her daughters or her sisters in struggles as she would refer them while we were eating in a small Indian restaurant in Bayreuth. We sat there breathing in every word, consuming every sentence she spoke until the restaurant almost closed. As we walked slowly back to the hotel, laughing, dancing together with my sister Mombi, I was filled with so much joy, love, respect, admiration. And I was so glad that she had accepted to come together with Mombi to Bayreuth. Those are the moments, the learning lessons that I will always carry in my heart. Her resilience in facing adversity serves as a powerful example of emerging scholar activists like myself. And so as we reflect on Walimu Mishere's legacy, it is clear that her impact is far reaching and continues to inspire the next generation of scholar activists. Her dedication to justice, equality and education provides a roadmap for those who seek to make meaningful contribution to society. And today, as we celebrate Walimu Mishere, we are reminded also of her enduring legacy. Her words continue to inspire, her activism will continue to ignite passion, and her teachings will continue to shape minds. I am grateful that today we are paying a befitting tribute to this graceful soul, path maker, daughter of the soil, daughter of the universe, this revolutionary visionary who never shelled away from speaking truth to power. And when women like Walimu Mishere, they really never die because their legacies lives on in us. We shall continue where she stopped as this is our responsibility as a younger generation to make sure that history doesn't forget her. Mishere Smugo's legacy is a beacon of inspiration for scholar activists worldwide. Her fearless pursuit of justice, groundbreaking contribution to literature, and commitment to mentorship serves as a guiding light for those who inspire to follow in her footsteps. Passing the torch to my generation ensures a legacy of resilience, knowledge, and activism that will continue to inspire change for years to come. The frame of progress will not only endure, but blaze lighter, illuminating the path for the next generation to follow. Each one of us has a part to play, and my generation has a responsibility to celebrate, honor, acknowledge Mwalimu Mishere and all the women who came before us every day of the year and to honor these black women sheroes. We honor their impact and bravery to pave the way for more young black women scholars like myself. And I, like them, want to make sure being the first does not mean being the last. To carry, the to to carry forward the torch of Mwalimu's legacy and to create future where scholarship and activism converge for the betterment of society. And if I am allowed, today I would like to propose that we can acknowledge her work and her as a pathmaker by collectively in the spirit of Utu, creating, for example, Mwalimu Mishere Awards for Social Transformation and Academic Excellence, or Mwalimu Mishere Lecture Series in every university across the globe. So I say Asante Sana to Mwalimu, beg you Muno, for her grace, generosity, her teachings, her fearlessness and honesty, and for allowing me to share in her life. 
Let us carry forward her vision, her courage, and her unwavering commitment to justice. Let us be inspired by her life's work and strive to create a world that reflects the values she held dear. In doing so, we honor her memory and ensure her legacy lives on for the next generations to come. And I stop as she always stopped uh, as when she wrote me emails with Ashe Afia Moyo. Thank you. Asante Sana. Dr. Rahab Jerry, thank you so much. Deep gratitude. Um, I see Mumbi uh, um, Wamugo, so I would I would actually directly uh, uh, hand over to you, Mumbi, and then I can respond from the uh, uh, perspective of uh, Mwalimu Michelle Gidaya Mugo's Universal Daughters, but now we want to speak about <laughs> not from the Universal Daughters, but actually from her daughters. Let's let's start from there. Thank you so much, Professor Uma. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Um, first of all, let me begin by teasing my sister and Jerry um, for not giving me credit for being the one who took that photograph of her with our mother in two 2022. I will come for you, my sister. But in all seriousness, um, let me thank you very, very much on behalf of my late sister, Jerry Koi. I would like to begin by thanking professors Maisha Auma and Wangui Wagoro for their tireless efforts in making sure that the event took this event took place and even more so for making sure that I was able to be here to honor my mother with all of you. I'm extremely honored to be here amongst such distinguished company. My deepest gratitude to Aswad and most especially to Dr. Kia Caldwell and all panelists for this very moving webinar. As many of you have already said, my mother's life revolved around the fostering of unity amongst people of African origin, and she constantly promoted understanding within, within these communities, shedding light on the oppressive structures and systems that affected them and continue to. She taught my sister and Jerry Koy and I the lesson that her own mother had shared with her our first year in exile. And I hope you don't mind if I read a short piece from her poem based on that conversation which took place the day after my maternal grandfather passed away. Daughter, do not romanticize home. Do not, daughter. For many who have hope, for many who are home have jail for home. Thousands who are home have streets for home. Millions who are home are crying for home. The whole land is crying for home. The whole land is crying. The waters are bitter. What shall we drink? Daughter, do not romanticize home. Do not, daughter. You who have chosen the path of people's struggles must find the courage to build new homes to start new lives wherever you are, be it in the air, be it on the seas, be it in the trees, be it in the desert. Create new life, create human beings out of this and build new homes on whatever path of ground your feet tread. Walk well, walk steadily, leaving behind you firm footprints. Walk well among the path you have chosen to take. It is no wonder then that she was a founding member of Aswad, an organization which stands for what she herself stood for. Sitting here today, I'm reminded that her tireless pursuit of Utu is not over. Look at her uniting us here. I have said that I, I am not deserving to ha or have, was not deserving to be Michelle Regidai Mugo's child, and I do mean that sincerely. Having said that, being her child has given my life purpose and meaning, and as I said on the day of her memorial here in Syracuse, I plan to spend the second part of my life building on her legacy. In a couple of months, I'll be traveling to South Africa to receive an honorary doct doctorate degree bestowed upon her posthumously by the University of South Africa, UNISA. And next year, we'll travel to Makerere University in Uganda. 
to receive the third honorary degree. Believe me when I say that she is extremely touched by what she sees and what has been done in the past eight months. As she continues to guide us as an ancestor, I hope that you will join me and others who are working to establish the Meshere Gedai Mogo Foundation, which will should be stood up and running in the next um, few months. As Professor Wangui Wagoro mentioned, in the meantime, please continue to visit in remembrance of misheregedaimogo.org, where we're posting symposia and events that are in honor of her this year. Thank you so much for helping me keep my mother's legacy alive. As my sister Jerry said, and in honor of mommy, I say Ashe, Afia, Moyo. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Mumbi. We have we deeply, deeply appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to come here and be here in person because you had written to us, obviously, but then you took the extra step to come here and then to read some of Malimu Mishere Gidaya Mugo's work. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to take a deep breath because that's that that uh, um has it's touching me very much to listen. As I said, we feel we are the universal daughters of Mwalimu Michelle Gidai Mugo, but you have this deep connection uh, uh along uh, uh, um the the length of her of your lives that that is is not even I'm not even able to to say put that into words, and that your uh, it's it's a it's a, a a toast. It's 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 um um I'm 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 going into German here. Um, it's it's such a um a good feeling to know that uh, a, a deep connection to Malimu Michelle Gidai Mugo is still here with us on this planet while she is now a part of our constellation in the universe and her work just keeps on <laughs> going going on and on. Um, uh, the complexity of home that you touched on is is also a part of what i'm hearing that that her work has made us all feel a little bit more at home in ourselves in in our understandings of africanness in in the complexity of living in exile of of um I, I am I was going to suggest we have half an hour. I was going to suggest that we open the floor and I can already hear some discussions happening. So if you do want to join the discussion, please give us uh, a, a signal. You can uh, are we able to raise our hands? Yes, we're able to raise our hands. We can write into the chat. I would like to widen the conversation. Also to our speakers, you're able to go back and forth and uh, um, ask for clarification, uh, uh, ask questions. I have a whole load of notes that I, uh, especially in response to Dr. Raham Jerry, still have here on on my uh, um, in in my in my notes. But I I would like to give um, everyone a chance to engage with um, the perspectives and the facets that we have had of Malimu Mishere Gidaya Mugo's life. And also thank you so much again, Mumbi, uh, for saying, um, uh, for, for also mentioning your sister, Njeri Koi. So also wherever Njeri Koi is, greetings to you and deep appreciation from us over here. Okay, I'm trying to look into the chat. Um, so Professor Wangoi Waguro has a, a question to Pro Pro Professor Gomez. And um, Wangoye Wagoro is asking um, if Professor Gomez can please talk a little bit more about what was at stake with the Curtin essay. Yes, uh, thank you for the for for the question. Um, I think what was at stake was the. Uh, I think that what was at stake was the fact that, for, so we need to re remember that the African Studies Association was founded by a group of scholars, University of Wisconsin, um, you know, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, they had exercise control uh, 
you know, to to a great extent over the trajectories of the scholarship, over who could be published, over what could be published, over who was being hired uh, uh, in these uh, in these positions. And um, uh, I think that is what the curtain article and the, the 1995 curtain article really reflected was this anxiety over um losing you know control of 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 you know of the field of african studies uh in the u.s and it, apparently and I, I don't know this for sure but my strong sense was that it came to a head because there was a position at Duke University that year. And um, the feeling among a number of us was that there was an attempt to kind of uh, pit uh, African descended scholars, you know, in diaspora against African scholars who were, uh, you know, born in the continent. And so there was this kind of thing that was going on. Um, and I think that's what was at stake. And Curtin, who was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Curtin founded the ASA, uh, but he was certainly one of the founders, uh, felt it important enough to take a public stand and decry what he called, and he, he used the term ghettoization uh, of African studies. Can you believe that? And so it was just, it was a, it was a moment, and uh, so that's what was at stake. But I would have, but I would say as well, if I may, uh, Professor Alma, that there was with the creation of SWAT, there was uh, some pushback, there was some resistance, uh, and so forth. But I would say that I'm very happy that what has happened in the aftermath that I don't attribute all of this to Aswad or even to, or much of it to Aswad, but under the capable capable leadership of subsequent uh, presidents like Leslie Alexander, uh, I think I mentioned Abu Abusia and others, what has happened for those of you who are still involved with the ASA and other like organizations is that there has been um, the, the understanding that our experiences are really linked uh, has only grown and that in organizations like the African Studies Association, uh, more and more panels on the African diaspora now feature. And that's why it has always had as, at its core uh, the study of the African continent. So if anything, there's been a flourishing of studies that acknowledge and pursue and interrogate the relationship between uh, all of these different experiences around the globe. So it's been really, and, and the ASA if in, has in fact, I think, uh, improved uh, over the decades. And uh, I've even attended uh, uh, one or two of their meetings. Thank you so much, Professor Gomez. I was, uh, um, yeah, uh, 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 for the very concise um, <laughs> analysis that it's an issue of control, uh, exercising control of the scope and the shape of scholarship and of Africanness and by implication of, of Black lives, um, which is uh, breathtaking to actually let it sink in, but there are also iterations and new, uh, um, uh, um, new attempts to recycle this kind of exercise of control, control in a different geopolitical spaces. So um, this can the Somali speak and the hashtag Kadan studies or the Adan studies would be one of them. White studies, I think is, is what that means. And then also for our context in Black Europe, in, in Germany, there was also the attempt to inaugurate Black studies in, in Bremen in the north of, of, um, of, of Germany by a white group of professors. Uh, claiming to have the first black studies, and we were like, "Where's the blackness in the black studies?" So this is this is a recurring 
um, 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 a recurring issue that we need to grapple with and, and that I think is always a very decisive uh, symbolic struggle of also a, a material struggle because it's about resources, about shares and, and so on. But it's it's also a, a manipulation of resources and, and opportunity hoarding, obviously. Um, so there's that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Professor M Margaret Washington, who is uh, writing in the chat. <laughs> um, so Washington, you're also very welcome to uh, um, uh, to also also uh, um, say that statement. I think you're writing that Professor Gomez is very diplomatic, which is true. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, an attempt to um, um, uh, to dismantle obviously white opportunity hoarding and also what you're writing to uh, um, it's colonizing African studies, which is a recurring instrument. So thank you so much for that perspective. Again, to everyone, you're welcome to um, share your questions, but you're also welcome to just uh, also direct your question to the um, uh, uh, to the room yourself. You're, you're welcome to actually have the floor to, to ask your questions or make your comments. And um, I'm checking into the chat, but I'm also going to ask the panelists again. And Madam President, Professor Caldwell, if you also want to uh, add on to anything or ask some questions, we have a good 10 to 15 minutes um, because we are now in the last 20 minutes of our um, webinar. We're going to end uh, in 20 minutes, but we do have about 10 minutes where we're able to um, deepen some of the, the, the points that have been made or ask some questions if anyone is inclined to do so. So thank you so much, everyone. This has been very rich. I think it's a, a conversation we need to continue. And um, as part of Azwa's leadership, Professor Alma and I, I think we'll be looking for additional ways to highlight the work and the contributions of Professor Mugo, because they have been many and they need to be highlighted, um, as Dr. Ndiri was saying earlier. Um, so there, I do see a question about Africa facing challenges. Right. There's a question in the chat. Africa faces many challenges by day and African scholars in Africa and the diaspora cannot tackle them all at once. However, what is one challenge or some challenges you think Michelle Mugo tasked us to tackle in order to bring about desired transformations? So that is a, a question, a big question um, that we could pose to, to the panel. So I would like to ask any of our panelists who would like to comment on that question to just indicate that they would like to comment on it. Yes, Wangoi, Professor Wangoi Wagoro, I, um, did I see a raised hand? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, again go back to Professor Michelle Mogo. It's getting dark here, as you can see. Um, and she talked about liberated zones. And when she talked about Utu, she talked about liberated zones, which for me is a very wonderful concept because sometimes we think that the whole has to be rescued, but because of the different contradictions in the localities, in the countries, the politics of the time, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the politics of the time, especially in academia, where there's a rolling back of academic freedom, which has been raised by a critical race theory. Us freedoming ourselves and asking the world to think with us about how we can freedom ourselves is being shut down politically. And which will have a huge knock on effect on intellectual freedom and freedom to speak. So wherever we are is my understanding, Ms. Sharon, I call her Ms. Sharon because she did say to us, she didn't like titles, you know, but she is Professor Ms. Sharon Mogo to, to, to all of us. Um, she said, wherever you are, just try and be part of solving those problems where you are. 
and where you can link up with others, link up with them and have solidarity with them. And for me, this has been a very big insight that I feel able to act where I am um, at, at any time. I should also just put a proviso that those comments in the chat are actually not from me. They are somebody, I think they're linked to me, but they're good comments. I don't disown any of them. Uh, and I, and, I'm, uh, and I, I did want to say that those struggles, um, I think, I hope that Asbot can talk about the rolling back, even in African universities, of those discourses of freedom. And I can just share that there is the first African Freedom School has been set up in Kenya, which is teaching children from an Afrocentric view. So the uh, Oderi wa Kenya has taken the project further. And I can see Mokoma Wangogi at Cornell and Professor Carol Boyce Davies are trying to decolonize the university. But this decolonizing comes with a chalice. It's a poison chalice because it takes us back not to freedoming, but again to colonialism. It's either post-colonial, decolonial, something colonial. So the centering of this ideology is around the concept of coloniality. And we're about something else. And I think that Aswad is about something else. And the contradictions that were had at that curtain time, I believe that they are with us. They never go away. And they do raise their head, like you said, in Germany, it's happening now. And new generations come. Here in the UK, we have only one Black History Studies with Professor Hakim Adi, and believe it or not, they are shutting that course down. All the institutions that would remind you that this was the headquarters of the largest imperial country, they are nowhere to be seen. We are fighting to get our artifacts back to our communities. So it keeps, it's a multiple headed snake. And we have to be armed and the importance of the associations such as us what are so critical. I'm part of African Studies Association for my sins because I believe that we have a responsibility for this legacy and we can't shy away, but we have to choose our battles carefully. Um, and we don't want to, you know, to, to, to lose our health, and, but working together in solidarity and finding strategies and it's only through institutions that we can do that. Because I'm unlikely to speak again, let me thank you and all the participants and the posse in Berlin. Thank you always for being present for us and to Rahab and to all the, I can't see everyone, but I, I can see um, that Livingston is here and I'd like to personally acknowledge his presence and, um, and everyone who's here with us. Thank you so much. Wangoi, as always, deep gratitude. And yes, Livingston Mukasa is also here and deep appreciation um, for your participation. Um, anyone who wants to say something again, please raise your hand. I see uh, one of one of uh, um, uh, Wangoi Wagolo's, pro uh, ah, okay, Peggy Pisha. Peggy, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, hello to everybody. Um, I, I just wanted also to uh, uh, extend my gratitude um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, on the road after our own uh, uh, conversation, what we had today about um, Black and PUC people and uh, remembrance of uh, uh, East Germany. Um, so from what I could catch on this panel, I'm, I'm deeply moved and um, I'm so grateful that we are in, uh, a transnational and uh, trans diasporic uh, uh, community and family and um, Rangu, uh, this was just yeah um, you're speaking to my heart and um, we are seeing we are staying connected and we will fight on of course and um, yeah my greetings to everybody this, this is just what I wanted to extend myself to you thank you Thank you so much, Peggy, from the streets of Berlin, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we we still we would have time for one more comment if someone wants to make a comment or add on anything. We have twelve minutes more to share today. Otherwise, I'm going to actually um, um, uh, echo what uh, President. Uh, Kia Caldwell has has already said that um, 
we're looking we're, uh, 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 Marika, yes sorry i'm seeing sister jerry's hand up yes yes please sister jerry <laughs> go ahead <laughs> my big sister speaking for me <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, and no, I just wanted to say that I think um, for me, and which has really been um, important, is um, the the re-education of the education that we have. Education is such an important uh, way of transformation. And as I said before, like my generation did not have that opportunity, like for uh, Professor um, uh, Wagoro to, you know, um, read the work, uh, be able to have access to that literature. Um, and so for me, and also what we are, what we try to do in Cal is actually archive this, uh, um, these narratives, archive these stories that, you know, our, the generation before, um, you know, can be able to share with us to actually have that, those intergenerational talks where uh, those missing gaps that we have, because either some of us are in the diaspora or some of us are not, uh, um, in the in, in the motherland, um, and so um, education has become very important for me because then we learn the stories, we learn the narratives of this generation. We then have access to them, and we can be able to you know decolonize our own way of thinking what actually education means. And so also in form of oricha, being able to speak in your own mother tongue and be able to tell those narratives in your own mother tongue, I think that is also one way of of transformation. And I'm glad that uh, Professor Wagoro mentioned uh, Professor. Uderi in the Freedom School in, in Akuru, where they actually had last year when I was there, uh, we also named a class after Professor Michelle Remugo. So there's a class named after Professor Michelle Remugo, and there's also a class named after Professor Ngugi Wafiongo, because we just think it's so important that also children within the continent, especially in Kenya, also have access um, uh, to uh, the works of Professor Michelle Remugo, but also of Professor Ngugi Wafiongo, and that they know that these scholars exist Existed and that yeah they are very important even as um, uh, as theorists within uh, you know uh, coming from the continent because this is also a question of representation it's also a question of uh, um, uh, now I'm thinking in German for builder um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forget the uh, role models. Role models, ex ex exactly. And when you go now to um, a freedom school uh, created by Dr. Oderi and Dr. Kanayo, children are actually reciting the poems of Mualimu Mishere. Yeah. And this is so amazing because this is something I had never had an opportunity to. So I think education and oricha and really reclaiming back our, our own African languages and our voices is one way that we are going to transform not only within the diaspora, but also within the continent of teaching in our own mother tongues and speaking our own truths. So I think that's also a form of transformation. Thank you so much, Dr. Raham Jerry. So um, before I hand off, uh, hand over to Professor Caldwell, to Madam President, um, I would like to um, um, just uh, 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 give two quick thoughts. One, I, in, the, in the chat, someone is writing something about the verb freedoming, which sounds <laughs> sounds really good as a future strategy to, to collectively think about. And then uh, Dr. Raham Jerry just spoke about the, the importance of re-education, which uh, brings me to all of these ideas of uh, naming um, 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 uh, uh, classrooms, uh, but also the idea of creating a, a syllabi, transnational syllabi for Ama Ata Aidu, for, for all of these uh, feminist African, uh, uh, pan-African giants uh, who have passed on for the freedom fighters. And maybe it could also be an idea to, to um, do something, a round table or something next year, the 25th anniversary on uh, the giants who founded Aswad, and then how we can also turn that into transnational syllabi as a, a form of um, of protection for black scholarship, for black lives, but also for black scholarship, for Africanness, for understandings of, of, of Africa and Africanness, and for these struggles that keep on rearing uh, their white centric, <laughs> white supremacist heads in, in, in new, new iterations. So that might be something to think around. Before I hand off to Madam President, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy day on a Saturday. Uh, to uh, come here and celebrate the influence of Mwalimu Michelle Givai Mugo. Mumbi, again, 
to you and to Jerry Coy, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope our paths cross in, in real time because there's also uh, uh, there's also an argument to be made for our bodies being in the same ge geopolitical space. So maybe next year in St. Louis, Missouri, where our president is might be uh, a place to meet. I'm going to hand over to you, Kia. Well, thank you so much, Maisha. I, this has been so incredible and I have pages of notes things I need to read and follow up on. And I think this has just been a really important way for us to kick off um, what I hope will be a series of several tributes to Oswald founders. We want to give our founders their flowers while they're here, but we also want to honor those who have passed on and are, are with the ancestors. So thank you, um, Professor Gomez for being here and thank you for, for founding Oswald. <laughs> as a space that we all can be a part of and um, pass on also to future generations. I think that that is a theme of the day is, you know, how do, what are the legacies we're each leaving, um, both individually and collectively. Um, I wanted to mention that this, um, this webinar, this conversation and tribute will be archived on our YouTube channel um, shortly. And so please um, share it with, people that you know who might be interested. Um, Maisha has mentioned our upcoming conference, so that will be in St. Louis at the end of October 2025. So not this year, but next year. And our call for papers will be released soon um, on our website and on our social media um, channels. And so I invite you all to St. Louis. It's where I am now. Um, and uh, it is a city that's rich in history, but also with a, a history of discrimination and um, displacement um, of Black communities here, but yet still we rise, you know, as Maya Angelou said. Uh, and I think that the roundtable idea is an excellent one um, as well. I just also wanted to mention that we have two more virtual events coming up this spring. Um, the next one will be on March 25th, and that will be a book talk with Bryce Henson about his book, his new book, Mergent Quilombos, and Bryce has been a major contributor to Oswald. He has served on our executive board. He did that before he earned tenure. Um, so he uh, has just really been so important in terms of Oswald, and he has helped to organize virtual events. So we'll be celebrating him and his scholarship on March 25th. And then on April 29th, we'll have a book talk with Alexis Ogogome, uh, who won our first book prize. Uh, last year for her book, The Souls of Women Folk. And so that will be continuing this theme also of Black women's contributions and activism uh, and just the importance of Black women to our global Black communities. So again, I want to thank everyone for being here today, both our participants, Mumbi, in particular, thank you also for gracing us with your presence and also for all of our attendees. And thank you again to Professor Alma for an outstanding job in organizing and moderating, moderating our discussion. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have thank a good you. evening.